Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel and happy new year. I hope 2023 is treating you well so far. For my first video of the year, I'm gonna do two things. Firstly, I'm gonna wrap up what I read in December, and then I'm gonna share some reading resolutions I'm making for 2023 to make this year an even better reading year than last year. Let us not tarry though, and we'll get straight in to the reading wrap up. In December, I read a total of five books and I've got four of them here and one of them was on Kindle. Four of those books were ones that I read for a video that I did where I took books from different countries that were competing in the World Cup and got them to battle it out to see who would win my World Cup of books. I'll link to that video in the description below, but I'll also tell you about those books and my experience of reading them in this wrap up. To start off with, the first book I read was Doppelganger by Dasa Drindich, which is a short book that contains a short story and a novella, both translated by different translators from the original Croatian. These two parts of the book are very subtly linked together, um, but not in any real meaningful way that sort of affects the arc. So you could read these stories independently. The short story is called Arta and Isabella, which is translated by Susan Curtis and is about two 70 something year old people in Croatia who go out on New Year's Eve and meet and have a bit of a sexual encounter on the street. Um, which is really interesting to see that explored in fiction because you don't often see older people um, sexualized in in this way. But they've got some interesting backstory too where one was affected by the Holocaust in World War II and another was involved in communism. And we see some of the implications of that as those two characters are monitored by the sort of secret service and we get some of their background. The second part of the book is more of a novella. Um, it's quite a bit longer than the first part and it's called Pupi and it's translated by Cecilia Hawksworth. It follows a down and out character called Prince who lives with his father at the start of the novel, but circumstances mean that he becomes homeless. I'm not gonna dwell on this book for too long because to be totally honest, I just didn't really enjoy it. I didn't really understand what was going on most of the time, particularly in the second part, which is the, the longer part of the book. I have heard that Dasa Drindich often intends to write in a really sort of annoying way to the reader and insists on that being sort of maintained in translation. And boy, does she achieve her goals because I just found this so stressful to read. It was like being in the mind of an anxious person. And I found myself sort of really desperate to get to the end. Um, it wasn't an enjoyable experience for me at all. You might get more out of it and there certainly are plenty of positive reviews on Goodreads. Dasa Drindic is a renowned Croatian author and she's got a number of well-regarded books. Uh, but I think they just they just weren't for me. Moving on though to a novel that was definitely much more my style, we've got At Night All Blood Is Black by David Diop. David Diop is a French author of Senegalese descent, and this was translated from the original French by Anna Moskovakis. This tells the story of two Senegalese men who are friends drafted in from Senegal to support France in one of the world wars. It's not mentioned which one, but we can assume, I think, that it's World War I. Very early on in the book, we see that Mademba is fatally injured and he asks Alpha to put him out of his misery um, and, and end his life. Alpha doesn't do this and lets his friend endure a much more drawn out, painful death. And the rest of the book deals with the implications of this for Alpha and his mental well-being and the way it affects his conduct on the battlefield. There's some really interesting questions that this book asks about sort of acceptable levels of madness and how sanity is suspended on the battlefield but expected to be sort of regained almost immediately when when you leave and come back to the trenches. It is absolutely beautifully written and it is a at times brutal and unflinching look on war. It's written from the perspective of Alpha in the first person and that voice is so singular there's some like really interesting ways that Alpha talks that are really distinctive so for instance every time he says he knows something he doesn't just say he knows it he says I know I understand and that has a really interesting level of meaning to everything that he's saying he's telling us that he doesn't just know it he, he sort of understands it deeply I really loved reading this book I thought it was utterly fantastic and a deserving winner of the International Booker Prize a couple of years ago I've heard that David Diop may have another novel coming out 
next year. And I'm really eager to read more of this author's work because he's a real talent. The next book I read was Lullaby by Leila Slimani, translated from the original French by Sam Taylor. Leila Slimani is a French Moroccan author, so I read this to represent Morocco in the World Cup. And this book is a bit of a domestic thriller. The book starts with a scene of tragedy where two children have died and their nanny is the one that has killed them and tried to commit suicide. Now, that's not a spoiler, that is chapter one in the book. In fact, it's referenced right on the cover. And I think one of the things that really surprised me about this book is that it is it's not really a thriller. It's not a whodunit. You're not trying to work out who was responsible for this because you know right from the start. This is a really surprisingly quiet book about how we got to that point. And so after that scene, we rewind right back to the point at which the couple, Miriam and Paul, are looking for a nanny so that Miriam can go back to work. And they find Louise, who is on the surface, a fantastic nanny. Um, she really looks after the children well. She goes above and beyond in her job. But we see this slow descent over the course of the novel and tension builds until we reach this breaking point. I thought this was really, really brilliant, actually. Um, it's very well written. It's not a page turner in the traditional sense, but I did want to keep on reading the whole time. As a sucker for a family drama, um, the tension that builds is, is really quite intoxicating and enjoyable. The next book I read was one called Talking to Ourselves by Andres Newman. I read this to have a book to represent Spain in my World Cup of Books video, and I was actually really shocked that I hadn't read a Spanish author before. I have read a lot of stuff translated from Spanish, but it turns out that that was all sort of Central and South American. Andres Newman is a Spanish writer, and this was translated from the original Spanish by Nick Caster and Lorenzo Garcia. It's another pretty short novel, um, and it's told from three perspectives, a mother, a father, and a son, as they deal with the impending death of the father who's been diagnosed with an unspecified but terminal illness. For a majority of the book, the father and son Mario and Leto go on a trip somewhere, intended as sort of a final adventure, but Leto doesn't know this, while Elena, the mother, stays at home. The book really lives up to its name. We alternate between chapters where each of the characters is talking to themselves and reflecting on what they know and what they're experiencing. I did enjoy the distinctive voices that Newman creates in this book. If we were to identify one of the characters as being the main character, it's interestingly not the father who's dying or the son who's on this trip that he doesn't know is the last time he'll spend with his father, but it's the mother, Elena. And she has a really interesting time while they're away dealing with some like thorny moral actions and behaviours as she's trying to cope with what's about to happen. She is a big reader and, and throughout the book deals with some of the things that she's going through by sort of speaking in conversation with the books that she's reading. So there's a lot of sort of quotes. There's a bibliography at the back of this book of, of all the things that, that she references. And to be honest, if I was to criticise this at all, it's at times it feels like Newman is sort of showing us through Elena how clever and well read he is, rather than sort of distilling some of those things into his his own authorial style. It's a it's a really heartbreaking account of grief before the person has has died and how people deal with those things and and prepare for the worst thing that can happen to a family. I really enjoyed this book. It's heartbreaking. So if you're looking for something to make you sad and I know a lot of people do enjoy a sad book, this may well be for you. Speaking of sad, the last book I read was Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell. This is a book that you have probably heard of and may well have read. This is a story about Shakespeare's son who was called Hamnet and that name apparently was indistinguishable from the name Hamlet, uh, which is one of Shakespeare's most famous plays. The real life Hamnet died when he was very young and this is an imagined account of how that happened and the effect it had on the family. It heavily centres Shakespeare's wife, Anne Hathaway, who's referred to as Agnes throughout this book. Again, apparently in the 16th century when this is set, uh, the names Anne and Agnes were pretty interchangeable in both sort of common language and official records. The book covers quite a lot of ground and we look at things from sort of two different timelines. One where Shakespeare and Agnes meet and fall in love and get married, and the other a number of years later where Hamnet sadly becomes a victim of the plague or pestilence as it's referred to in the book. I think I had really high expectations of this book. I've been told by a number of people that it's a reading experience like no other and it's like desperately sad. And, and while it was sad, 
I have to say, I felt it was really quite overwritten. Um, it felt like every sentence explained things three times when it could have been a bit sparer and, and explained it once. And maybe this is a style that a lot of readers get on with and find really emotionally resonant. But for me, it made it feel like a bit of a slog to get through. And I did find myself not wanting to pick it up at times. I was also kind of made to believe that William Shakespeare is very absent from this book. And while he's never named as Will or as William or Shakespeare, he's always talked about as the husband or the father or the author. He is actually very present. And so not using his name almost felt a little bit gimmicky to me. I kind of wish he just called him Will. I don't know why that bothered me. Maybe my own fault as a reader. The book is told in two parts. The first part being these two timelines that lead up to Hamlet's death. And then the second part is the fallout from Hamlet's death. And I think that second part actually worked a lot better for me. It became like a book not separated by chapters, but separated instead by these scenes and vignettes. And I think that quite skillfully reflected how it must feel when you're grieving, sort of zoning in and out of the world around you, which carries on regardless of, of the fact that you've just lost a loved one. Overall, I thought this was a good novel, but maybe not my specific cup of tea. It felt a bit like a chamomile when... I'm more of an Earl Grey kind of guy. So that's my December reading out of the way. Let's move on to my reading resolutions, where there are three things that I want to try and achieve this year when it comes to reading. The first thing, inspired a bit by some of the reading I did last month, I want to read some books by authors from countries where I haven't read books from there before. When I was doing my World Cup of Books, I, I looked to do the, the actual 16 countries that made it through to the round of 16. But while it was still uncertain who was going to make it through from the group stages, I tried to sort of identify books that I had read from each of the countries in the World Cup. And I was surprised, actually, at countries like Australia and Spain and Germany I'd never read books from before. And it highlighted to me a bit of a gap in my reading life. And I think there's a lot to gain from sort of reading widely and diversely. I mean, that's not, <laughs> that's not the most stellar insight you've ever heard in your life. It's obvious. But it's something that I want to rectify. I don't know exactly how many. I don't want to overcommit and make reading feel more like a job than fun. But maybe like five or six books from countries that are completely new to me will be an awesome achievement in 2023. My next resolution is to read some more longer books. And something that comes with that is probably to read fewer books. So in 2022, I read 60 books, and that's the most I've ever read in a single calendar year. And I'm really pleased with the achievement of, of reading that much and, and enjoying reading that much. But by striving to read more and more and more books, I also find myself leaning towards shorter and shorter and shorter books. And don't get me wrong, I love a novella. Love a short book. They can pack a real punch and sort of wallop you over the head with some real emotional heft in a small number of pages. But I think some of my most satisfying reading experiences are really long books. Uh, they're ones where you get to deeply know the characters that you're reading about. And I think there's a, an emotional investment and payoff there that, although is not necessarily more valuable than what you get from a short book, but it's a different reading experience. And as we said, a diverse reading life is a good reading life. This is also somewhat tied to the fact that I've amassed a bit of a backlog of big books. And I'm probably going to do a video about the biggest books I own um, sometime in the next couple of months. But I really do need to start reading more of them. Finally, my third resolution is to read a little bit more non-fiction this year. I'm interested in reading a bit more memoir, a bit more narrative non-fiction, because when I do read those books, I really enjoy them. But I need to make sure that I prioritise that sort of reading, because although I love fiction, it's my first love, and I'm not going to turn my back on it, I do think it would be a good idea to make some room for non-fiction in my reading life. Again, I'm not sure how many non-fiction books I want to commit to, but maybe let's keep this Let's keep this achievable and I'll say I want to read books from five countries that I haven't read books from before. Five of my longer books, so maybe books that are more than 500 pages, five non-fiction books. And then that commits sort of 15 of the books I read this year to these goals, which I think I can do. Maybe. We'll see. Anyway, if you've got any reading resolutions or things that you want to change about your reading life in 2023, uh, let me know in the comments. I'm really interested to hear and it might inspire me to adopt a few more. Who knows? But that's it for this video. If you liked the video, I'd really appreciate a thumbs up on it. And if you're not subscribed to my channel yet, why not hit the subscribe button and then you can see my next video and the one after that and the one after that. 
I'll be back next week with a video where I tell you about every single book that I did read last year. But until then, toodles.